In this presentation, we are going to take a look at Joseph Smith Matthew chapter 1. That's found in the Pearl of Great Price, which is the Joseph Smith translation of Matthew chapter 24. And then we'll take a look at Matthew 25. So first, let's take a look at Joseph Smith Matthew chapter 1 in the Pearl of Great Price. There are two questions in Joseph Smith Matthew chapter 1 verse 4 that the apostles asked the Savior. The first question is, when is the destruction of the temple? And then the second question is, what is the sign of thy coming? The Savior has told them that he would come again, and so there, and that prior to that coming, the temple in Jerusalem would be destroyed. And so they asked these two questions. To look at this chapter, I have put it in the format of a timeline for those who are watching this on YouTube. Because the Savior kind of gives a timeline of the events in answering these two questions. First is verses 6 through 12, which is refers to the time of Christ, of his time period and the time of the Apostles. So let's take a look at what he says during that, what will happen during that time period. Chapter 1, verse 6, there he says, many will claim to be Christ. This is after he leaves and ascends into heaven and the apostles run in the church, that there will be many that will claim to be Christ. Verse 7, the apostles will be hated and delivered up to be killed. And so he prophesies concerning that event. In chapter 1, verse 8, he says, There will be many that take offense and betray one another. So he said that will be a sign of events during the time of the Savior and of the apostles. Verse 9, there will be many false prophets. Many will claim, come claim to be prophets and be the leaders of Christ's church, but there will be false prophets. Verse 10, iniquity will abound and love will wax cold. And so there's going to be hard-heartedness during this time period of the apostles and after Christ leaving his ascension to heaven. Verse 11, those who remain steadfast and do not give in to the world will be saved. And so he says, don't give in to the temptations of the world or fall into the traps of these false teachings that are going to come after he leaves. And then verse 12, then will come the destruction of Jerusalem. So he says that will be one of the signs. Now, by 70 AD, because the Jews rebel against the Roman Empire, Titus sends Vespasian to destroy the Jews. And so by 70 AD, this is fulfilled. By AD 135, Jerusalem is completely destroyed where there is not one stone left standing of the temple and that the Jews are then scattered throughout the Gentile world by the Romans. Now, verses 12 through 20, he gives personal counsel. And the only thing I'm going to take a look at or comment on is verse 12. In verse 12, he says, Then you shall stand in the holy place. He gives that counsel to his apostles. Well, what is that referring to? Bruce R. McConkie writes, The counsel that the saints then stand in the holy place means that they should assemble together where they could receive prophetic guidance, and that would preserve them from the desolation of the day. The place of their assembly became holy because of the righteousness of the holy ones who comprised the Lord's congregation. And so he's telling the saints, stand in holy places, stand with those who hold the keys of the priesthood, who guide and lead and direct the church, that you can receive counsel from them. That would be the holy place. Well, that would be true today as it was then. 
so we should stand in holy place that we should assemble and receive prophetic guidance that would be the holy place where we should stand verses 21 through 25 then the savior now prophesies of the apostasy that is going to come after he leaves verse 21 many will claim to be of christ verse 22 there will be five false Christs and prophets that will deceive many with their false religions. So there will be many false religions that spring up after the Christ leaves and in the time of the apostles. And many will leave and flock unto them. Verse 23, there will be wars and rumors of wars. Verse 24 through 25, do not go after those who claim to be Christ or his representatives. Stay with the twelve apostles who hold the keys of the priesthood. All of this is advice he's giving to the apostles that it's going to happen in their day. But this is, we still have similar things happening today in this council applies to us. Verses 26 through 36, he said, Then there will be a restoration and the latter days. He now tells of things that will happen in the latter days. Verse 26, Like the light of the morning, the restoration will begin and slowly spread until one day it covers the whole earth. And so that's why he gives that symbolism of just like the light slowly starts in the morning and just continues to grow and grow and the sun rises and goes there will be a restoration of light of the gospel in the latter days and it will grow and grow the church will grow and grow verse 27 like eagles that gather to a carcass so too will god gather his people and so there will be a gathering in the latter days so that will be one of the signs of his coming. 28 through 29, there will be wars and rumors of wars. Nations against nations and natural disasters will come. So that is a sign of his coming. Verse 30 through 32, again, iniquity, iniquity will abound. Love wax cold the gospel preached to all the world and there will again be a destruction of the jews in jerusalem just think of the iniquity that is happening today and all that is going on and how people's hearts have turned cold and have waxed cold you'd have to be pretty hard and cold-hearted to do the human trafficking and the drug trafficking and stuff that is happening today Verse 33, then the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give her light, and the stars will fall from heaven. Verse 36, he says, then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. The only person I know that is coming on what that means is Joseph Smith, and here's what he said. But what will the world do, the prophet Joseph Smith asked, when they see the sign of the coming of the Son of Man? They will say it is a planet, a comet, etc. But the Son of Man will come as the sign of the coming of the Son of Man, which will be as the light of the morning coming out of the east. So evidently it will appear as if it's like a planet or a star or something because of its brightness, its light, his actual coming, and they will mistake it for some planetary phenomenon or comet or something. But it will be the Christ coming as the Son of Man. And then verse 36, it now says will be the Christ's second coming. And he gives some personal counsel concerning his coming. Verse 27, in order to not be deceived, we must treasure up God's word. If we're not going to be deceived and follow these false prophets that will become in the latter days also, then we must treasure up his word. 
we must be constantly studying and listening not just to the standard works, the Book of Mormon, the Bible, and the Pearl of Great Price, but also treasure up the words that we get every six months in general conference. Those who will do this consistently and constantly will not be deceived and follow after false prophets. Verses 40 through 46, Christ come comes in a time when most will be going through the daily things of life, like in the days of Noah, and not be prepared. Watch, therefore. It, it's given, people would, like it says in verses 4 through 46, people will be marrying, they'll be married, they'll, they'll be living their life, and we'll, we'll be going through life just through normal things. And when he comes, just like he did in the days of Noah, they were going through people. They were given a marriage. They were going off and going to work. They were doing the normal habits of everyday life. Then all of a sudden, the storm comes and the flood comes. So it will be with the second coming. We will be going about our natural business when his coming comes. He, but those who are paying attention to these signs will be prepared for his coming when it comes. It will happen naturally, I think is what they're trying to say. So there's Joseph Smith, Matthew chapter 1, and how Christ answers the two questions of this, the destruction of the temple, and what is the sign of his coming. And so there'd be false prophets, don't follow them in the times of Peter, James, and John, and after them, Jerusalem would be destroyed, and then there would be an apostasy. There would be a restoration, there, which there will be also again, that there will be false prophets who will come, and Jerusalem again will be destroyed. That is another one of the signs that Jerusalem will again be destroyed, and there will be warfare there, and much destruction. And then we must, in order to not be deceived and to be prepared for all these things, we need to heed the counsel of treasuring up God's word in our lives daily, consistently. Well, let's turn to Matthew chapter 25 now and to the parable of the ten virgins and the parable of the talents. First, let's take a look at Matthew 25, 1, 13, 1 through 13, which is the parable of the ten virgins. First, concerning the oil, Doctrine and Covenants, chapter 45, verses 56 to 57, gives us this insight about what the oil was symbolic of in this parable. It says, And at that day when I shall come in my glory, shall the parable be fulfilled which I spake concerning the ten virgins. For they that are wise and have received the truth and have taken the Holy Spirit for their guide and have not been deceived, verily I say unto you, they shall not be hewn down and cast into the fire, but shall abide the day. So the oil then is symbolic of the Holy Ghost, of the Holy Spirit, to guide us in our lives. We need the lamp is us, our lives, and we need the Spirit and the Holy Ghost inside of us so that we are not deceived. So we learn from section 45 that the Holy Ghost is, that the oil in the parable of the ten virgins is symbolic of receiving and the guidance of the Holy Ghost in our lives. Number two, our lamps have gone out, Matthew 25, verse 8. Frederick Farrar who was a great biblical scholar, gives a translation of the phrase, our lamps have gone out, as found in Matthew 25, 8, as are smoldering, smoldering, or are being quenched, which he quite aptly interprets to mean that the light of God's Holy Spirit is dying away in the earthly, earthen vessels of their lives. And so, so, so those that were foolish were not taking the Holy Spirit as their guide, and their lamp and their light in their lives is being quenched. It's smoldering. It's slowly dying. If we do not constantly add that oil, if we don't constantly do things to keep the Holy Ghost in our lives, 
then we that light in our lives starts to be quenched. Number three, concerning the ten virgins, Bruce R. McConkie writes, not good and bad, not righteous and wicked, but wise and foolish. That is, all of them have accepted the invitation to meet the bridegroom. All are members of the church. The contrast is not between the wicked and the worthy. Instead, five are zealous and devoted, while five are inactive and lukewarm. Ten have the testimony of Jesus, but only five are valiant therein. Hence, five shall enter into the house where Jesus is, and five shall remain without, all of which raises the question, what portion of the church shall be saved? Surely this parable is not intended to divide half the saints into one group and half into another. But it does teach, pointedly and plainly, that there are foolish saints who shall fail to gain the promised rewards. I found that very interesting and very informative. That the ten virgin represents members of the church. Five are wise, a portion are wise, while a portion are foolish. Foolish in the things in their lives, in the way they're living, in their testimony, and foolish in not doing those things which would bring the Holy Ghost into their lives. So this parable is not meant for the world, it is meant for members of the church. That's who he is talking to those who have a testimony, and those who are members in Christ's kingdom. Number four, concerning the five wise virgins, not giving oil to the other five, the, uh, Brother McConkie again writes, Salvation is a personal matter. It comes only to those who keep the commandments and whose souls are filled with the Holy Spirit of God. No man can keep the commandments for and on behalf of another. No one can gain the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit in his life and give or sell that holy oil to another. Every man must light his own lamp with the oil of righteousness, which he buys at the marketplace market of obedience. I love this. Drop by drop we are filled with the Holy Ghost as we are obedient unto his counsel and direction. Only those who keep the commandments will be filled with the Holy Ghost. Continuing at Brother McConkie. All that one person can do for the salvation of another is to preach, teach, expound, and exhort. All that one can do for his fellows is to teach them the truth and guide their feet in the paths of virtue and rectitude. All that the five wise virgins can do for the foolish is to tell them how to gain oil for themselves. And the foolish virgins who do not come to know the bridegroom by the power of the Spirit will not qualify to sit down with him at the marriage feast and there partake of the blessings reserved for the wise. So once you understand what the oil represents and the Holy Ghost and getting the Holy Ghost and his guidance in our lives, you can see why the five could not give any oil to the five, the five wise could not give any oil to the five foolish. I can't give the Holy Ghost to you. You have to receive that in the market of a marketplace of obedience, drop by drop, as we are obedient unto the direction of the Spirit of the Holy Ghost in our lives. Now let's turn to the parable of talents, Matthew 25, 14 through 30. There is an eternal principle that states, service is essential to salvation. In the parable of the ten virgins, Jesus dramatized the truth that to gain salvation, men must keep the commandments and be guided by the Holy Spirit. Thus, obedience is essential to salvation. But now giving the parable of the talents, he completes the picture. 
Not only must mortals keep the commandments to gain an inheritance in the Father's kingdom, but they must also get outside themselves in service to their fellow man. It is one thing to be virtuous and pay tithing. It is another to persuade others to walk in paths of purity and to make their means available for the building up the Lord's earthly kingdom. The Lord will not be satisfied with the salvation of Moses alone. He ex expects the great lawgiver to guide all Israel to the summit of Sinai. Both obedience and service are essential to salvation. The specific intent of the parable is to teach how the servants of the Lord must use their native endowments to further the work of him who is now going on a learned journey to a far off heaven there to be with his father until that day when he shall return to live and reign on earth a thousand years. Further, all men, and the servants of the Lord in particular, acquired in pre-existence by obedience to law the specific talents and capacities with which they are endowed in this life. Men are not born equal. They come into mortality endowed with the abilities earned and developed in a long period of pre-mortal schooling. And a just and equitable being who deals fairly and impartially with all of his children expects each of them to use the talents and abilities which, which, with which they are endowed and the gifts that are given them by divine providence. Those who embark in the service of God are commanded to serve him with all their heart, might, mind, and strength. And it is the will of him who created us that men should be anxiously engaged in a good cause and do many things of their own free will and bring to pass much righteousness. All those who are sent forth to preach the gospel are subject to the, the divine decree, thou shalt not idle away thy time, neither shalt thou bury thy talent, that, that it may not be made known. It's Doctrine and Covenants 60, 13. Be not weary in well-doing as the counsel to all, for the Lord requireth the heart and a willing mind. The Lord expects his servants to be diligent, to be occupied till he comes, to labor on his errand with all the strength and power they possess. That was from Brother McConkie's The Mortal Messiah, book three. So the parable of the, ta of, of the talents is teaching us that all of us were given to develop different talents and abilities before we ever came here. And that we are now expected in the service of our fellow men to use those talents to help others progress also and to use those talents that he has given us to further God's kingdom. From these two parables, we see two major principles that will prepare us for the coming of Christ are one, obedience to every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, whether by mine own voice or the, by the voice of my servants, it is the same, so that we can gain the guiding and sanctifying influence of the Holy Ghost. That would be from the parable of the ten virgins. And then number two, from the parable of the talents, using all the days of our lives in service to God with all our hearts, might, mind, and strength, which service will be seen in our service to our fellow man. For when you are in the service of your fellow beings, you are only in the service of your God. So there are two major principles that we need to develop in our lives in order to be prepared for Christ's coming whether that is his actual coming in person or that is us meeting him when we die and return back to his presence. One, obedience. The importance of obedience so that we can be, be guided and directed by the Holy Spirit. Receive that oil in our lamps. And two, using the talents that he has given us and were developed before we ever came here in service to our fellow man. Those two things will help prepare us for Christ when he comes, 
when we meet him. Well, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button and consider subscribing to the channel.